self-control issue, love or selfishness. you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. That's pretty cool, isn't it? No matter what's happening in the world today, God is in control. God has it all under control. Sorry about that. How's that? Nope. All right, I'm trying. How about now? Okay. I think you put your thumbs up, right? I couldn't see them, but I can see 2020 from here to the first pew. I got this. Everything, at, no, I'm just kidding. I'm a little bit better than that, Mark, honest. I do drive. I'm a little bit better. Not much, but a little. Can you imagine? Let, let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, the central issue is love or love. Love of you or love of ourselves. Help us to remember that the more important one for our eternity is love of you. And loving ourselves is warped if we don't start with loving you and putting others first. Help us to remember that in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We're going to look at twofold strategy that Satan uses. Does Satan use love to destroy God's people? Yes. The answer is yes. He uses a false love. He uses a love of the world. He uses a love of life. People are like so afraid. Oh, I don't know if I can go through the times of persecution. I don't know if I can, I can uh, uh, do without things in life. You know what? That's narrow-minded thinking. We got to remember God's in control. Amen? And we're told. Let's go to Matthew. I need somebody to read Matthew 23. 37, 38. Satan tries to destroy us, right? He tries to deceive God's people, and then he destroys God's people. Christ uses love. Satan uses force. Christ uses truth. Satan uses lies. Christ uses faith. The devil uses doubt. Christ uses um, working. The devil uses worry. There's always a dichotomy, isn't there? There's always a dichotomy. But when we look at Matthew 23, 37 to 38, we're going to look. And I need somebody to read this text. Can somebody please read this for me? I will. Go ahead. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together 
as a hen gathers her, gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look at your house is left to you. Look, your house is left to you desolate. Can you imagine? I've sat on the Mount of Olives where Jesus talked about this, looking over at Jerusalem, looking at the Golden Dome, looking at the sun setting. I can't imagine what it looked like with the temple there and with what things look like. And Jesus, with tears in his eyes, says these words. Jesus is saying that something, I mean, think about being there. What is God saying? I have loved you like a mother loves her children. Mark, do you know how much your mother loves the children? It's, it's unexplainable. I, I've said this many a times. You know, you as a father, you, you father a child, and you have a love for a child. But a mother's love is much greater than my love could ever be. I, I call it mama's love. There's, there's no, a, a mother will go to all ends of the earth for their children. My mom was a 115, 20 pound little uh, Polish woman, right? She's this big. She's like this big. Little scrawny little woman. Oh man. She said, I will die for Jesus, but I will kill for my kids. Yep. What are you saying, Ma? That's crazy. We can't understand the mother's love for her children, can we? We don't. We don't understand that amount of love that a mother has for her children. Have you ever seen on the news media where the, the child was accused of killing like three or four people and the father's like, oh my God, I don't know what he did. I just, I don't understand why my son did that. How does the mother react? They love him just the same. Completely the opposite. Completely the opposite. It can't be explained. I don't know how else to explain it, but the mother's love is just incredible. The mother's love is incredible. I can't imagine Jesus sitting there. And he, he went to, to the people. And they refused God, the author of life. They refused him. And that's why he utters those words. But it's awesome, God in his providence. Let's read Matthew 24, 4, 15 through 20. Matthew 24, 15 through 20. And when you go to Matthew 24, there's another text in there where it talks about Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another, nor thrown down. And he said this at the Mount of Olives. And then you got these words, these words in Matthew 24, 15 through 24. 15 through 20, sorry. Somebody want to read this? Dave, you got it? Sure. Matthew 15 to 20. What's it? 24. Matthew 15. No, Matthew 24, 15 to 20. And Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem that would happen in 70 AD. But he gives a promise. He gives a promise.
So when you are standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken out through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then those who are left, who are in Judea, flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetops go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be for those pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place on the winter or on the Sabbath. There it is. God tells people that, hey, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. God tells them, when you see the abomination of desolation. Did you know that abomination of desolation happened in A.D. 64, five years before Jerusalem is sacked and destroyed? The Roman armies had surrounded Jerusalem. They were going to destroy Jerusalem. They had just given an ultimatum, and all of a sudden they retreated for no reason. The Jews were so excited they followed the Romans, and they, they started beating up on them and thinking, oh, we got a great victory and everything. But you know what the Christians did? They remembered what Jesus said. And in God's providence, they left the city. We know this for a fact because we know that the records say that they went to Pella over in Jordan. They went to Aleppo. They went to all these other places getting out of Dodge. They got out of Jerusalem and the surroundings. Those early Jewish Christians knew that Jesus said, when the place is surrounded, get out. And they did. And you know what happens the next time they surround Jerusalem in 70 AD? They destroyed it. They destroyed it so bad that they knocked over boulders that weigh four and five tons, eight to 10,000 pounds. They knocked them over. Now, why would you do that? Because the Bible says no stone will be left unturned. It's amazing the complete and utter destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. But God always has a plan. God always has a plan. So, I got a question. Does this mean that those of us who are Christians, we're never going to be killed. God's going to preserve us no matter what. That's something for you to answer. No. You say nah, but why? How do we know? Can God preserve us, yes or no? Yes. Will God do that for some people? Why does he choose to save some and not the others? <laughs> the golden question. Turn to Friday. Turn to Friday. Turn to Friday, and where does it say? The mysterious providence. Do you see that? Which permits the righteous to suffer persecution at the hand of the wicked has been a cause of great perplexity to many who are weak in the faith. Some are even ready to cast away their confidence in God because he suffers baseless of men to prosper while the best and pure are afflicted and tormented by cruel power. Then look at what it says. Mark, can you read that? Yep. How, it is asked, can one who is just and merciful 
and who is also infinite in power, tolerate such injustice and oppression. Hold this on. Has that gone across social media? Oh, yeah. Does that go across social media? Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Every single week, doesn't somebody post that? Right? Every week, somebody's like, well, if God's a God of love, how come he's allowing people to die? If God's a God of love, how come he allowed October 7th? If God's a God of love, how come he allowed Ukraine? Why does he allow children to starve? Why does he allow this? Why does he allow that? Now go ahead and read that next sentence, Mark. Nice and loud and proud. This is a question with which we have nothing to do. God has given us sufficient evidence of his love, and we are not to doubt it, his goodness, because we cannot understand the working of his providence. What is that saying to you? Go ahead, Dave. God has his reasons, and we shouldn't question him because he's higher and more powerful than any of us and more intelligent and he knows more than we do. That's right. Yeah, exactly. I don't like that answer, by the way, D Dave. <laughs> I don't like that answer. <laughs> well, because I want to question <laughs> everything. How many of you want to question things? Yeah. Question why things happen. Yeah. Come on, I know you do. Yeah. That's our humanly nature. Why does God allow some people who are just scoundrels and scums to live a life to be 90 years old, but somebody who's in just a wonderful worker for the Lord, they get cut down when they're 20 years old? You, you know, one thought, could yeah. this be, you know, what is... What is our position in, in the next world? Are we, are, is, is this training ground for us? If you can't handle it here, how are you going to handle nations? And how, you know, so I, I, I truly believe that, you know, we, if we can't handle this simple earth, imagine what's next. And there's a position for us, and we, we could be being prepared for whatever that next position is. Let's go to Hebrews 11, 35 to 38. Hebrews 11, 35 to 38. I just thought of something, Ron. You don't have a Bible. It's at home. Yeah, I know. Yep. I'll see if we can get you a Bible. I think somebody's coming in and we'll be able to get you a Bible, okay? Look at this. What's this chapter all about? Chapter 11. Faith. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's read it. Women received their dead raised to life again. Hey, Susan. Can we grab Ron a Bible from the um, library, please? He forgot his. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a resurrection. Still others had a trial of mocking scourgings. Yes, some chains and imprisonment. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins, goatskins, being destitute. Afflicted, tormented, of whom the world said weren't worthy. They wandered in the desert, mountains, dens, caves, the earth. And what does it say in verse 39? And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Okay, the idea is that here's the deal. Can the devil kill our bodies? Yes. I can walk down the street and somebody who's angry at me can kill me in an instant. Can the devil kill my salvation? No. 
who's the only one who can lose my salvation? Us. <clears throat> In this case, it's me. Yep. Mark can't pray for me and make sure I have salvation. Right? Now, it can help. But my salvation is based upon my acceptance of what? Christ and him crucified. Correct? It has nothing to do with me. Here's the deal. Somebody could kill our physical bodies. Is God going to, could God raise them again? Of course. Could he raise them again in the last days? Of course. Could he stop somebody from murdering us? Yeah. Yes. And the mere fact you got up today is God's providence. Did you know that? You woke up out of bed this morning and you said good morning and you got up and it's a great day. Because you know what? There's people who went to sleep last night they didn't get up this morning. They're either resting in the Lord or they're resting in themselves. Howard, back to that concept of... Please. The, once again, I, I correlate a lot to the business world. And if you're, you, you work for an organization and there's a lot of things that happen at the upper levels of the company that are proprietary, confidential, and things that people shouldn't really know below in the organization. So mm -hmm. decisions are made at a very high level that people don't know why or understand why, but they mm -hmm. just have to trust that the decisions that are being made. And I think it's the same thing with God where, you know, we are, there's like a dome over us. There's certain things that we need to know. And as a company, <laughs> there's certain things that employees need to know. But above that dome is somebody making all the decisions for certain yep. reasons. And, 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 and it's not, there's, there's a rhyme and reason for every decision that's made. It's not just made out of spite. It's made for a strategic reason. So God's plan for us is in that above the dome of us of not really understanding. And it's our job as an employee or as a Christian to trust in, in the organization and trust in God and what the decisions that are going to be made because they're the ones in control. I love what it says on Monday. Did you, did you see this? Where it says God experienced hardship, persecution, imprisonment, and death for the cause of Christ. People of God experience God also experienced that. Was Jesus, ex did Jesus experience hardship? Yes, he did. Did he suffer persecution? Yeah. Yes, he did. Did he suffer imprisonment? Did he suffer death? Yep. Then how dare we sit there and say, God is not fair because this has happened to me. When I was suspended two years ago for doing something that I didn't do, for saying things I didn't say, and then I guess for, I guess I had done, wow, some of the things I heard I had done, I'm like, seriously? I was like surprised. At the rumor mill, but it's alive and well, by the way. I said, God, how can this happen to me? I'm an elder in the church. I've fought for almost 30 years for civil rights for students, for black students, for brown students, for Asian students to be treated equally. And to be accused of this, I got a call from a friend. He said, dude, your daddy's the owner of the heavens. Your daddy controls everything. 
He allowed this to happen to you. You need to figure out what God wants to teach you yeah. in this. Amen. And I and I told my I, I told my African American friend he's an elderly man. They accused me of saying these words. He said, "I brother, I have known you for 25 30 years." He said, "I'll get on the witness stand and say he's not like that." But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I say, what anybody else says. What do you know? See, that's the key. It's what you know. Check it. Let's read this again. There will be times when the people of God experience hardship, persecution, imprisonment, death for the cause of Christ. But even in the most challenging of times with Satan's most vicious attacks, God sustains and preserves his people, his church. I can be killed. It's okay. If my death causes five people or one person to come to the Lord, I'm good. I'm sorry, but I'm good. They, he can kill our physical body, but he can't stop the resurrection. And that's what really upsets me. Did you want to say something? Okay, we got a mic coming at you. They can kill our physical bodies, but God will raise us again. Please understand. And then I want to read this last statement, and we'll move on from Monday. Go ahead. Yes. Um, earlier, you make a very good point. Christ is our exemplar. And if he went through all those, the imprisonment, abuse, and imprisonment, and also death, then we as his follower will go through it too. And if we are maybe lucky not to go through all that, then it's a luck and it's a blessing. So it's all good. There's a lot of people, things happen to them, you know, and they will say that, why me? Why this? I always wonder why a person would even say that when we claim to be a follower of Christ. He, go, he went through it, and all of this is because of sin. And he went through it to show that if we are going to be his follower, a true follower, then expect these things to happen. So, yep. brothers and sisters, we got to <laughs> really think hard about the Christian walk. Yep. Yep. Buckle up, because it's going to get fun. And, and to add what the dean yes, was saying, uh, I fully agree. And what happens is, we sit here today and go, oh, yes, I understand, I understand. And then all of a sudden, your body is of this unbelievable pain. And then all of a sudden, our carnal knowledge says, oh, my gosh, why is this happening to me? Yeah, yeah. It, it, I could sit here and say the same thing, but then that's when the enemy steps in and the pain and the suffering that you're going through puts that seed of doubt in your mind. You could sit here every day at church and then go through something horrible and traumatic and yet our faith is still tested. Some people are, are awesome with getting through it, but other people, it's challenging. It, 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 it puts a check in their system. Um, so uh, the, we have to truly, truly be prepared for the worst and understand what yeah. the worst is. Yep. Amen. Yeah. That's so true. And on Monday, <clears throat> Monday it says, in vain were Satan's efforts to destroy the church of Christ by violence. Satan can't destroy us by violence. You know why? Because God's got this. we got to talk about this one in a minute. The great controversy in which the disciples of Jesus yielded up their lives did not cease when faithful standard bearers fell at their post. By defeat they conquered. God's workmen were slain but his work steadily progressed. So the question is, how do we remain faithful amid persecution? That's a question. 
if you stay God close to God, He will help you through it. He'll and you stay faithful, and everything will be okay. Yep, stay faithful to God. Good, excellent. How do we have faith among amid persecution? The more I live, the more I'm coming to the realization it's not about us. It's not about us. We're insignificant until we start to shine the light for Christ. Did you know that here it is. Were the disciples fearful? Yeah. Okay. After the resurrection, were the disciples fearful? Yeah. Nope. Read Paul. When you read Paul, what happened to him? He was beat how many times? Right. There it is. Okay, thank you for the qualification. After the Holy Spirit, after the resurrection of Jesus, were they fearful? Go ahead, Dave. Before that, in the upper room, they were afraid. They were assembled for, out of fear. Mm-hmm. But what made them change? Go ahead, Dave. They were empowered from the Holy Spirit when it came upon them. Okay. Um, can we have that same power? Yes. How do we get that power? How do we get to have the, the power of the disciples, that, that um, tenacity, that even though persecution's coming, I'm going to be faithful? How do we get there? Well, we have to have a close relationship with Christ Jesus, you know. We have to have the Holy Spirit to work within us because we have ourselves. We will never have it, okay, or smart or whatever degrees we have. It's through Christ Jesus we can mm -hmm. have that power to resist the adversary, the devil. Okay. The lesson has one sentence that I thought was just phenomenal. One sentence, but before I read it, how can we be faithful among persecution? I would say one of the most important things that we need. I don't want to say it. I want somebody else to say it. Us personally. Go ahead. See if you see if you and I are thinking the same thing. I'm not sure I know exactly how to say this. Um, I'm not looking forward to the persecution. I'm not looking. I'm not looking forward to tomorrow, you know, because I don't know what's coming tomorrow. And one of the problems I have is that I dwell on the fact that I don't know what, what, I'm, what the problem's going to be tomorrow. And when the persecution strikes, I, can't, I, I, I have to stop thinking about the persecution. I have, I have to stop thinking about the trials. I have to stop thinking about... What, what is Satan conjuring up for me next? Uh, I, what I have to start thinking about is, what a wonderful Savior. How much do I love Jesus? Jesus will see me through. So if I start focusing on... Uh, I, I was uh, doing something. I, I, I don't remember exactly what it was. But I remember I got myself in a position I couldn't get out of, and it was very, very frustrating because I used to be able to move better than that. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't raise my arm over my shoulder anymore. 
And, and, and that's where I got. I had to get my arm over my shoulder so that I could do what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking about that, and I, I got angry. I was mad. And, and then I realized um, <laughs> when my wife came in and said, you know, instead of mumbling and grumbling and getting mad, you can ask me to help you. And uh, that, that's an eye-opener to me. I don't have to rely on myself all the time. I have to stop thinking about, oh, poor me, woe is me. I have to start thinking about there's help available, and I should be grateful for that and call upon that help and use it. That's what it's there for. And then when I change my focus from why am I being persecuted, why, why, am, why is this happening to me, and I start thinking about God must have something in plan for, in mind for me because he's allowing this to ha happen to mm -hmm. me. Um, let me start relying on him. Yep. Change the focus of my thoughts from, oh, woe is me, to, oh, how grateful I am. Okay, you're, you're like, oh, you're so close. Uh, how many, your moms, as teenagers, what did they tell you you need to change? Your attitude. Your attitude needs to change, young man. Did your mom ever tell you that? Am I the only, you and I, Dean, are the only ones? <laughs> Lana, did you ever tell your kids that? Change your attitude? I told my sons that. We have, and, and Mick just really said, I don't know how to say it, but you kind of did. We got to change our attitude. Who cares about the persecution? The Bible says we're to expect persecution. How many times has the Bible been right? All the time. So therefore, A, we're to expect persecution. Are we supposed to worry about it? We got people running to the woods, running to buying houses out in the country, trying to get off the grid so they're not detected by the government. I got news for you. You can't escape the technology. For seven years, they've had a bullet that takes a picture of you and follows you around. It's scary stuff, right? They've got it. Old Elon Musk, he's not that old. Elon Musk can take a picture of writing that small and make it that big and get a good view of it. Folks, if you're out there worrying about persecution, Ellen White says the blind's gonna, the devil's going to bring negative, blind, dumb fear. And you know what happens when you act dumb? You don't think. And you know what happens when you're afraid? You don't think. I would think of a, 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 Navy, a Navy SEAL. A Navy SEAL is trained to not have feeling, to not have, to react. I mean, we almost have to be trained Navy SEALs because those, those folks, if, if, they, if anything gets in their head, they'll make a mistake. So it's almost reactionary to everything that they do. But it's through training. So once again, how do we, how do I train ourselves as Christians to, to be like a Navy SEAL where it doesn't matter what someone says or does or happens to you, it's, you know exactly what your reaction is going to be and how to react to it. Change the attitude. What, what Mick said, change the attitude and shift our focus from looking at ourselves to looking at Christ. I do not know. I read, how many of you have read Fox's Book of Martyrs? I don't know how the people who were lit on fire stood there and sang songs 
as the flames are burning half their body. But they did. That's only through Christ. I, I, I don't know how they went through it, but you know what? It's okay. Here, here's, here's what the author of the lesson, Mark Finley, says. One glimpse of the resurrected Christ changed their lives. Jesus gave them a new reason for living. We got to have that view of the resurrected Christ in our lives. We have to. And the most important thing we need to do is to care for others. Did you know that? That's what we're put on the earth for. It's real simple. It's Christ's love or it's our love. Sheep or the goats? Which one do you want to be? Turn to Acts 2, 44 to 47. Acts 2, 44 to 47. They had a lot of other verses, but I thought this was kind of cool. Somebody want to read this for me? Acts 2, 44 to 47. Yes, sir. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to everyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the courts, temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Did you catch that? So they continued daily in one accord in the temple. In other words, they were involved with each other. They were involved in caring for the community. They didn't just look out for number one. Devil wants us to ignore other people. You know, going to El Salvador, doing that mission work, that is something I'm excited. We're doing it again next year. We're going again next year. And we're going to find a new school. We're going to find new people who need um, uh, wheelchairs. And maybe I can make a difference in somebody's life. I have no idea. I, I'm absolutely amazed. Well, it's all about love. Let's go to John 13, 35. John 13, 35. It's all about love. Do you got it, Mark? Yep. Because I don't. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. One another. Somebody looked at me who's not a Christian, and I showed her the pictures of the kids in the um, school where we took the shoes to. We actually, it was, it, it was, it was pretty cool. We, we had a pinata, we had cake, and we had juice. The and, this is pretty cool, the donations that I was able to get from the, um, from the YMCA and people who donated here, we were able to buy shoes for the young kids so they could have another pair of shoes at the school. The mayor found out we were doing that, the mayor of the region, and you know what he did? He went and made sure every kid walked home with a ball that day. He bought 40-some balls, I guess. Susan, you had met him the day before, and he found out you were going to a house, and he had done something else, didn't he? Okay. He had gone, they were going to a house to give a lady a wheelchair, and this, so Carlos Sanchez, who's the mayor of this district, he went out and he bought, with his own money, a mattress for this person so they could have a mattress to sleep on. Is that cool? When you do kind things, kindness begets kindness. So my friend, 
Amanda said, oh my God, I go on trips. I just go on vacations so I have fun. I'm going on a cruise with my family. Oh, you are such a good person for doing this. I said, no, I'm not a good person. I said, I'm selfish. It's only because of God that I'm not so selfish. My wife is less selfish than I am. And she goes, I don't care what anybody says. I, I don't care what anybody says. Y you're a great person because you went out and you did that. But it's not me. It's because I'm a Christian. I want to make a difference in somebody's lives. Right? I, I don't know. It's not about me. Do you think, oh, Jesus. do you think, there is, if, if you've ever helped someone, there is a very warm feeling that you get, especially the satisfaction, the gratification. Mm -hmm. If, just think about if every human just did one kind thing to someone uh, to experience that. And unfortunately, we live in a world where it's the, the world of me and not not of someone else, and I think it's, you know, when God said, love thy neighbor like thyself, it was, an, I think he understood the value in you reaching out a hand to somebody and helping them and what the value that brings. I, yeah, but it's, I told her because I'm a Christian, I'm doing it, I'm trying to witness to her. She keeps saying, oh, no, no, you're a good person, you're a good person, because she, doesn't think that way. It's a, it's a different mindset. Susan wants to say something. First John uh, um, 421. I want to read that while we're going to Susan. And so you have to accept that, Howard, because it's God's goodness that covers you. And you could say thank you I by did. God's grace. But you, you, you can't say you're not a good person because God has made you good. Yeah, but but it's not about me. I got gotcha. you. And 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 First John, I agree with you, by the way. And First John four twenty one, and this is the commandment that we have: that he who loves God must love his brother also. It doesn't matter what Bainol does. It doesn't matter what we do. If we don't have love one for another, then guess what? We're not doing any good. I thought Thursday was interesting. Did you read this? If you didn't, I'm going to read it to you again. I'm sorry to bore you, but one of the most greatest revelations of God's love was demonstrated when two ravaging, devastating pandemics plagued the early centuries around AD 160 and 260. Christians stepped forward, ministered to the sick, and the dying. The plagues killed tens of thousands and left entire villages and towns with scarcely an inhabitant. The unselfish, sacrificial, caring love and ministry of Christians made a huge impact on the population. Over time, thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions eventually became what? Christians. They became Christians. The love, the outgoing concern, the organized, selfless care of the sick and dying created an admiration for the believers and the Christ they represented. So I thought about this. Is there a message here for us? Yeah, I think there is. Because I decided to do something as a historian. I looked at the Black Plague. And you know how they treated each other in the Black Plague? They killed the Jews because they claimed the Jews had done it. They claimed the Jews had poisoned the waters, so they killed and beat Jews. And then they said, Another reason why the Black Plague happened is because we're not holy enough, so they walked around beating themselves with um, ropes and, and nails attached. So they beat themselves, self-flagellation. And then, if somebody got the plague, 
They marked it on the door of the house. And nobody went in there. And nobody helped them. And the people died in isolation and loneliness. And I thought, man, that's cold and heartless during that plague, wasn't it? And I thought about the pandemic. And the young lady who couldn't see anything and took her own life. And she was a member of this church. She took her own life. And if you listen to her computer and her recordings before she did it, she said, I can't stand being alone. I don't know what to do. I don't know where God is. I have no human touch. They won't let me out of my apartment. They only bring me food. Nobody talks to me. I want somebody to be my friend. I want somebody to sit and talk with me. And I thought about the way we've done the pandemic. I'm not saying here at this church, but I'm saying here as a society, did we have love and caring? Or did we shut out a lot of people with the pandemic? Did the Christians act in love? Like they did in 100 and 160 and 260? Did they do that? How are we going to act amid persecution? It's coming. If you haven't seen it coming, it's coming. Cancel culture, whole nine yards. It'll be a matter of time before they turn it on us. I don't care. God's in control. God's in control. The devil can do whatever he wants. He's powerless against Christ and a soul committed to him. Did you know that? The devil can't do anything against a soul that's committed to Christ. We need to remember that. As we're going through the great controversy, Mick, I'm jealous because you get to teach both the 20, 20th and the 27th if you want because I'm going to be out of town on the 27th and next week is your week. This is a great lesson. If you've looked ahead at the lessons, and if you haven't done this, just get the app on your phone. Daily listen to it. I listen. I go to my Sabbath school app, and I listen to it every day. I listen to it in the morning. Sometimes I listen to it in the afternoon, and I listen to it at night. I study each day three times almost. It's fun. It takes about two, three minutes to have somebody read through it. It's awesome. The technology is out there. Folks, the great controversy, the war between good and evil, between Christ's love and Satan's love, which Satan's love is just selfishness, but he masquerades it as love. So we need to remember that. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for being the awesome God you are. Help us as we go through our daily walk with you that we may grow closer to you, that we may grow closer in your relationship, closer in understanding you, closer in understanding what this world is about and what it's going to throw at us. Help us to stay close to you, Jesus. Ask that we also gain a blessing from the mission story. May we learn how God's people are working in other countries, over in Asia and India, to help people about the love of you. Amen. Amen. Learn about the love of you. Mibruo Balthazar had no idea that his life was about to change when he received an invitation to watch the Hope for Africa series 
sponsored by Hope Channel. Recently, Hope Channel sponsored this evangelistic event in Kenya. Hundreds of thousands of people experienced life transformation and were baptized through the powerful Word of God, presented at about 10,000 locations throughout East Central Africa, broadcast on Hope Channel platforms, and shared online. Miburo, the founder and leader of a Christian church in the nearby country of Burundi, was invited to watch the event at one of the downlink locations. In 2011, Miburo embarked on a spiritual quest for biblical truth. Frustrated by his search for a church that fully embraced his yearning for authentic spirituality, he established his own congregation. He watched the presentations for three days and was captivated by what he learned from the event's main speaker, Pastor Mark Finley. Miburo, eager to share this newfound information, invited his congregation to join him in watching the rest of the programming. Miburo made a life-altering decision, dedicating himself anew to Christ and choosing to be baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist. Half of his congregation joined him after a few days in this transformative journey. I am extremely happy to have received the message of salvation and even happier because my congregation willingly joined the Adventist church. My greatest desire is to see the people in this area come to Christ because time is very short and Jesus is coming soon. By the end of the series, the other half of the congregation also embraced the faith and were baptized. This story celebrates the profound influence that Hope Channel programming can have on countless hearts in Africa and around the world. Hope Channel's mission is to share the gospel through a global network. Currently, they broadcast more than 80 channels on television, as well as produce content for social media and digital platforms, including YouTube, in more than 100 languages. Hope Channel celebrated its 20th anniversary in 2023. They seek to extend their network to fulfill Jesus' command to take the gospel to all nations. Please pray for Hope Channel as they open new channels to reach unentered areas. Thank you for supporting the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church.
Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all here today. Uh, it's kind of a rainy gray day, but it's good to be in here where it's warm and dry. I would like to welcome you all today. Um, we have one guest, uh, Dana, who's visiting today. We'd like to welcome you. And at this time, we'd also like to have our congregational greeting to, to welcome everyone and our visiting guests. Thank you. Just wanted to remind everybody that Vespers will be tonight at 6 p.m. And uh, make us an announcement regarding one of the, the inserts in the bulletin. So I'd like him to come on up now. Good morning, good morning. Happy Sabbath. You'll recall a couple of weeks ago, the large committee to nominate the nominating committee Say that three times fast. The large committee to nominate the nominating committee met and uh, a nominating committee was formed and approved by the church and they are beginning to meet now. And the, their purpose is to try and fill the positions of the church that need people to do those tasks. And one thing I'm grateful for is that I have seen in the last several months an influx of people coming back to church. I love it. We actually had, I didn't want to say it, we actually had to start children's Sabbath schools up. We had to. We had children here. Remember when we didn't? And now that we have these, this influx of new members and transferring members and lots and lots of kids, we need to start filling some of those offices again. And so the nominating committee, which you elected, is meeting now to fill those positions. And of course, they would like to know because there's a lot of new faces. Some of you, I, can't, I don't even know your name yet. So pound on my shoulder, shake my hand, and let's meet each other, all right? The nominating committee would like to know, how would you like to get involved? Do you want to get involved? 
Of course you do. So they want to know, what is it you'd like to help out with? The best way to do that would be for us, for the nominating committee, to meet each and every one of you. But that's not the easiest thing to do. <laughs> and so what, what they've decided to do is put an insert into the bulletin. If you open up your bulletin, you'll find that insert. And what I'd like you to do right now is look over that insert. And I'll keep talking for however long it takes for you to take that out and start reading it and looking it over. So please don't take a couple of hours. We've got other things to do too. But look it over. See if there's something there that appeals to you. Circle that, and you can circle more than one. Let the nominating committee know that you're available and want to help. They'd love to know that. Would you do that right now? Take that out. If you need a pencil, we have pencils available. If you need something to write with, just raise your hand. Someone will be there with a pencil. Take that bulletin insert out, look it over, circle those, the, those areas that you'd like to be involved with. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, you be sure you put your name on there. <laughs> Sorry, Doug, I should have said that. You can put it in the offering, in, uh, the offering plate when it comes around. You can give it to a deacon. You can look me up and give it to me. Uh, just uh, probably the easiest thing to do is just fill it out, put it in the offering plate when it comes around during the offering call. All right, we'll give people a second or two to finish that up, and then we'll turn it over to the praise and worship team. <laughs> okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for bearing with us with the delay. Our first song will be hymn number 367, Rescue the Perishing. Thank you. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We bore the erring one, lift up the fallen. Tell them, O oh Jesus, the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Though they are sliding him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demanded. Strength for thy labor, the Lord will provide. Back to the 
the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wonder a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Please stand for our opening hymn, hymn number 181. Hymn number 181, Does Jesus Care? Dear Heavenly Father, we know you care for us so much. But sometimes, Lord, we worry. We doubt that you're there. We doubt that you're listening. But you're always there. You're always listening. And you always care. Help us to realize that truth in life. That no matter where we are, you are. Oh, Lord, I ask that you would be with the people who are on their way. May you give them safety and travel on the way here. And Lord, may you just be with each one of us. May we bring glory and honor to you as we perform our duties. And as we, um, as we just are here in this cathedral of time, help us to have the blessing that you promise us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. You may be seated. The offering today is for Hope Channel International. Give hope through your offering today. The impact of Hope Channel 
is evident in the inspiring stories of God's children like Pastor Ross and Baby Aurora. Ross overcame drug addiction to become an ordained Seventh-day Adventist pastor after discovering Hope Sabbath School. Following Baby Aurora's brachial plexus injury at birth, she was miraculously healed thanks to the most watched Let's Prayer program and prayers on her behalf from our global community. With our offering today, Hope Channel can continue to share the transformational love of Jesus Christ with people all over the world by producing high quality Christian content to reach new audiences in innovative ways. Our Hope Study platform is online and offers Bible studies in a range of topics. So far, over 300,000 people have started a course just one year after the platform went live. People are hungering for Bible truth. As we read in Proverbs 11.25, whoever brings blessings will be enriched, and whoever waters will himself be watered. By faithfully supporting Hope Channel International, you are not only blessing others, but yourself as well by bringing hope to those who need it and by telling them of the love of Jesus Christ. Also, let's uh, also remember to put the surveys in the offering plate as the deacons collect the offering. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for allowing this opportunity to participate in your mission to the world. Please bless these funds to further your work. In Jesus' name, amen. Special prayer has been asked for uh, several individuals. One is uh, Cesar Nunez, who is ill at home and uh, is asking for prayer. And traveling mercies for uh, Jennifer in Japan. That's all I have to go on. And also, Ainel Cunningham's daughter is asking prayer for her mother, Ainel, who's having surgery on Wednesday. So keep her 
in our prayers. And Longview Terrace is uh, asking prayer for two books that have been provided uh, for this address, I think, and uh, pray that they will read them. So someone's doing their missionary work, so we'll offer a, a prayer for that. Are there any that would like to raise their hand and indicate that they have an, an unstated prayer that they would like to, uh, yes, it's almost unanimous. <laughs> I suppose the list would be too long if everybody sent it up. Huh? <laughs> All right, shall we uh, kneel as far as possible and uh, uh, get in a reverent uh, state and we'll have prayer. Our Father and our God, we humbly bow before you, recognizing that you are our eternal Father, the one who sustains life and gives us the spark of energy that we need as we go about our lives. And we're so thankful for your watch care over us. And we've just read a few names that uh, are requesting special prayer. And we hold up these names of these folks and also all of us that raised our hand because we have unspoken requests. We want to pray this, uh, this morning for the leaders of our nation and the leaders of the nations around the world. Because it seems like that the world has gotten very small and the problems in one place spill over into problems with almost everywhere. So everywhere there's strife and commotion. And we know that you're the only, the only one that can deal with it and bring peace. But we know in the end we'll have no peace. But we ask your blessing. We ask your blessing that nothing comes nigh our dwelling, that no evil comes nigh our dwelling. We pray for the president of our, our United States and the government uh, that is uh, in charge and uh, and protecting us, protecting, protecting us with uh, armies and, and, and things like that. We're thankful that we have vigilant uh, public servants who are wi willing to serve, and we ask your blessing on them. May they do your will, Father. We also want to remember members who are not here, that we've mentioned some today, but I'm sure there are many others that would uh, feel the need of prayer. We all feel that need, and we cannot have enough prayers said over us because we know that the evil one is always ready to take an opportunity to distract us and, and bring us to evil. We're thankful for that, that cloak that you've put over us to shield us from the evil one. We pray for our, our uh, church school, the teachers, and all the students. May they have a productive year, and we pray for them and hold up the teachers as, as the ministers who touch the hearts of these young people. And we're glad that they have the opportunity to have a, a Christian-led education. Bless us now as we go into the after service and keep us close to your heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
All right, children, it's time to come up and to collect the lamb's offering that supports the church school here at Bain Hall. So come on up and we'll collect the offering. Did you get some from Howard? Okay, he's got that wad of cash. <laughs> okay, check the inside of your bucket. Okay, good. Look what we're doing, Ganta. You know the song? Yeah. Look at her dress. Okay, you check the bucket. Is there anything else? There we go. Good. inside, make sure there's nothing good. Good job. Oh, man down. Good job. Okay, nothing stuck in the bottom. No, keep it open. We got more people coming over. Okay, Howard has some more if everybody wants to go help him get rid of all of his dollar bills. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think we got everybody, right? Okay, good, thank you. Who's taking the bucket? Here, let me get this out of the way. Okay, guess what time it is. What is this? The love box, right? And today it's special because the outside of the box matches the inside of the box. You'll know what that means in a minute. Okay, don't, don't spoil it if you think you know, okay? We still have to sing the song. Are you guys ready? You remember it? Okay. What is in the love box? Who can tell? Maybe it's a flower, maybe it's a shell. What is in the love box? Look and see. Something that shows God's love for me. Do we think that was enough to open it or do we have to do it one more time? Yeah. You guys want to do it one more time? Come on over here. Sing the song with us. Even if you don't know it, you'll learn it. Come on over. Okay, they're scooching. Okay, one more time. Everybody join us, okay? What is in the love box? Who can tell? Maybe it's a flower, maybe it's a shell. What is in the love box? Look and see. Something that shows God's love for me. You guys did just a great job. I think they all have it down pat by now. So let's see what it reveals. We have here, this is separate. What do we got in there? Everybody can take one. Pick your favorite.
Okay, did everybody get a sticker? Okay. Does any, you want to tell everybody what's on the sticker? A butterfly. Yes. And that's what's on the pattern on the outside of the box. Yes, butterfly. Also, for anyone who doesn't know, the word in Spanish for butterfly is mariposa. So that'll be our little Spanish lesson for today. Um, but, so the butterfly, do you guys know how, what the life cycle of a butterfly is? Tell me. So first they start in an egg, and then they, and then um, they come out, then they, they grow like these, um, they, they, they sort of look like a worm, I think, and then they grow wings, and then, and then they have babies, and then, and then they go into grown up. Then it starts all over again? Yeah, so actually, it, the, she's right. They're, they start, uh, they put their eggs on leaves, and then they um, form a chrysalis when, they turn into a caterpillar, a chrysalis first, then a caterpillar, and then um, it emerges from the chrysalis and it becomes a butterfly. So um, some diagrams will show you four steps, some, some will show five, but basically it's the same thing every time. So, but, you know, the butterfly is very interesting. Go ahead. Um, what if it's like a very caterpillar? What the same thing? Well, moths also follow the same process that a butterfly does. So depending on the kind of caterpillar that you find, you will get either a butterfly or a moth. But the butterflies are significant in a lot of ways because if you think about it, obviously they're God's creation and they all have a purpose. Um, they, I feel that the butterfly symbolizes a resurrection of a sort in that, um, you know, and then the life cycle that we experience now that obviously that only exists in this world, which is good because then we'll never experience death later on. There will always be butterflies. They won't, they'll just be able to go through only the life cycle. But um, one thing that butterflies also do is they function as pollinators. Do you guys know what a pollinator is? Have you heard of a pollinator? Do you know what a pollinator is? You do? It's like a bee. It, gets, it goes in a flower and then, and then it like just stays in the flower for a little bit and then it gets out and then there's pollen all over it and they bring it to their hive. And you know what else happens is when they move from flower to flower or from place to place, they actually spread the pollen around to um, other flowers and then that actually helps provide food for people and for other animals. So they yes, they're like bees and like birds, butterflies also pollinate. So that's huge because if we didn't have creatures like the butterfly, that would be really hard for us to have food or have other flowers or other things around, right? So they're very important besides being very beautiful. So I like to think of all of you as our little butterflies because in the way that butterflies pollinate, and help to spread life and to other places. You can do that too, because you can do that with the word of God. So do you like telling other people about Jesus? Do you have a chance to do that in your daily life, like your neighbors or your, your friends at school? Have, do you have any experiences that you want to share of how you do that? We do what? How you share the word of God with other people, like butterflies spread the uh, pollen, the pollen to produce life. We we like to share the word of God to spread the you know the spiritual word food to everyone. Oh uh, well, here's something. Uh, well, when when somebody is like who like they say it's probably just an explosion to make the world. I would say uh, like. Who, like, that can't just happen because who made the explosion happen? Amen. That's really smart. I like that. So, and that's what you tell people? Well, I have another thing that I like to uh, tell people about because it's a really good end time message. It's found in Revelation, and it's called the Three Angels Messages. And I was going to, I brought some. Uh, little booklets here to share with you so you can act like butterflies except for God, for the word of God, and share it with other people. 
It's called, see the three, three final warning messages to the planet Earth. This is actually an amazing facts track. So I didn't know if you wanted to maybe take some and share it with your friends, your neighbors, your schoolmates, and I'm sure they would listen to you and they would want to hear it from you because they know you have the truth and you're their friend and you care about them. And that's why we share the word of God because God loves us and he wants us all to get back to him. So we're going to go out like the butterflies do and pollinate with the word of God this, so that spiritual food is grown and that everybody gets to hear about Jesus coming back for us and that it's coming really, really soon. Are you excited about that? I know I am. Come on, let's show some excitement for Jesus coming back. Whoa. One, Yes, yeah, see? Malachi's got it. Yay. That's what I say. So here you go. Take a few if you'd like. You can read it at home. You can copy it. And then you can look at your butterfly sticker and then remember why you're doing it. So here you go. Okay, did everybody get some? Okay, here you can take some out of the back there. And then does anyone want to say a prayer to thank the Lord for butterflies and then for his word and how we can connect it to all of the creatures like butterflies that are also showing us how to do that job, but in their own way? Anyone want to say a special prayer or you want me to do it? You want to say a prayer? Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you give us. Please bless us, and thank you for the butterflies. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Take those with you. Sarah for that children's story. Good morning. Good morning. The scripture reading today comes from Matthew chapter 6 verses 25 to 28. <clears throat> Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Thank you. Good morning, happy Sabbath. You know, I got to tell you, for three weeks now, I've been battling with my voice back and forth. My wife says, don't talk. I thought for sure I'd have a good this week and my, my uh, bilingual pair would be in. Turns out he was gone all week. But he didn't tell me he was going to be gone all week. So each day I had prepared a discussion because I needed to discuss something with the kids. And each day he wasn't there. And then just the talking back and forth and doing things. And so hopefully God will um, continue to give me a strong clarion voice. I'm not worried though. Don't worry. Be working. Right? Amen? Don't worry. It's all good. God's in control. In fact, if you're working for the Lord and hard work and dedication, you don't have time to worry about all this silliness of what's happening in the world today. Right? So the question is, where are you? Worry is not the way of God. Dedication and hard work is. We learned in our last sermon that the devil uses fear and doubt. Well, now we're going to compare worry and trust. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything you've done. We ask that you would just be with us, Lord. Hide me behind you. 
may people only see a reflection of you in the words that I speak, in the thoughts that you have for them today. We thank you, O most gracious Father, for everything you've done, and we ask that you'd be with us in a very special way. Help us to love you more fully each and every day. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about El Salvador. I hope you don't mind. If you do, that's too bad. I'm going to talk about El Salvador anyway. Okay. Susan and I, um, with Pastor and his wife and um, people from Wayland and, and people from um, Rome, Utica area, and somebody from Connecticut, and then somebody else, I can't remember, um, came from someplace else. Anyway, we went on a mission trip, and we went for wheelchairs for El Salvador, Mark chapter 2, and we took things, and we took shoes. Uh, some of you gave some donations, and I'm great, I greatly appreciated the donations you gave. The children loved the shoes. It was the highlight of the day. Um, if you ask me, uh, the skit that my team performed, as opposed to Susan's team, was better, but, you know. And the kids also thought it was better, but in the end, it was a tie. Um, but we had a good time, right, Susan? All right. Uh, but I want to go to a text, uh, not Matthew 6.25, but it's based on Matthew 6.25. And it comes from Ellen White. And she wrote the words, Worry, not work kills. When I first read this, I said, no, I can't be right. My dad worked himself to death. My dad literally worked himself to death. He started a farm when he was in his 30s. He made it a million point two operation back in the 70s. We had four different barns. He started with nothing. And he built this all on his own. And my wife reminded me of one thing. He had a bleeding ulcer. You know where bleeding ulcers come from? Worry and anxiety and stress. And then he had a massive, well, I think he had a brain aneurysm, but he could have had a massive heart attack. They say it was a heart attack, but he was dead within um, 30 seconds of being around six doctors at a hospital dance. And my sister died of a brain aneurysm, and it runs in the family, so it's possible. But anyway, worry, not work, kills. It is not work that kills. Have you ever had somebody tell you, I'm so tired I could die? Wrong! You can't die because you're tired. You die because you're worried. The only way to avoid worry is to take every trouble to Christ. Let us not look on the dark side. Let us cultivate cheerness of spirit. Isn't that interesting? She says that. Worry kills. Work does not. Get that out of your mind. Oh, he's working too hard. He's going to kill himself. He's going to dig himself into an early grave. How many of you heard that phrase? Nah. It doesn't mean that. This, was the, this is where we went in 2022. You remember 2022. It's when Howard Krug went to El Salvador for the second time and the devil tried to kill him twice. Um, this is where I got food poisoning in 2022. But this was the little church, makeshift church that we went to. And we were there, and the head elder had donated her land for the church to be on. And all, of they, all they had, do you see what they had? They had a, a, a pole, and then they had a gabled roof. Uh, a stainless steel roof. Not much there, right? The chairs were brought by the people because she didn't have enough chairs. The chairs were donated by people in the community to bring in for this little celebration that we had. And we had a pinata, and everybody had fun. And this is the first time we passed out shoes. Remember this, Sarah? It was absolutely incredible. It was so much fun. There was a little boy in a, in a, in a hammock, and I... I thought I included the picture of him, but he was like Superman. He was awesome. 
Um, he was confined in a hammock, and he got a wheelchair for the first time when he was 17 years old. He looked like he was 12 years old. But the Wickies in Wayland Church, Mark Wickie had brought down some money, and he said, we want to help this church. We want them to have a permanent church. So we have some money here. We're going to go home. We're going to raise some more money. Please use this to build a church. Fast forward two years later. See that guy standing there? See that guy? His name is Oscar. Oscar is my superhero. Okay? Bar none, Oscar is my superhero. Oscar quit his job, and he works eight to ten hours a day building the church where money was donated. Do you see the bike? He rides that probably up and down the hills 12 kilometers every day to get to the church. To build the church. Now Oscar had his shirt off when he was working and that boy is ripped. Okay? He looks like he's about 20 years old. And he does this 8 to 10 hours a day. And talk about dedication. You know how much Oscar gets paid every day? $12. $12. He works 8 to 10 hours a day. And he's digging that trench. See him right down in there? You see him? He's right there. He's right there in the trench. And he's standing there. And he's digging in the trench. And this is a church. Because in addition to Wayland's money, another uh, three or $4,000 came in because people were super excited because Waylon donated some money towards the church. So then some other people said, hey, if they're going to help, let's help also. So guess what happened? Other people donated to the church. So they got $4,000. So this church, you see all those people all those pipes and stuff, they're building a church for $20,000. Unheard of, right? They're making their own bricks. Their work be every Sunday, they, okay, so Sabbath, they come to church, Howard, they come to church, they worship in church, and then they go home, and then on Sunday morning, they come back at 8 o'clock in the morning and they have a work bee till sundown to build the church. That piping and everything, that's coming from there. The building that's in the back where that red part is, that's where they're making the bricks. They make the bricks on Sunday and then they got to dry throughout the week and then they make another batch of bricks. And by doing this, they're spending $16,000 for materials, and they're spending $4,000 for labor. So this is our group standing here. And we feel pretty good about ourselves because we donated the money. I told them, I want to come back and I want to work with Oscar. I thought it had been awesome, yes, the other day. To come back the next day and work with him, I don't think I could keep up with him. He goes for 8 to 10 hours a day digging in dirt in the, with a pickaxe. But... Sabbath, they had their work be. Guess what they did? Oscar had dug out all the trenches, four feet deep, around the church. He, on Sunday, sorry. Um, Sunday, they had their work be. They started laying all the cement, putting in the rocks, putting in the rebar. And in the end, this is what it looks like. That's what they did on one Sunday. One Sunday work bee, they did that. That's pretty awesome, amen? That's dedication. When I asked Oscar about doing this, he said, I wanted to work for the Lord, and this is the best way I could do it. His cousin Carlos gets um, $30 a day because he's the architect. We actually raised some money so we could give 
um, Carlos or, um, um, Oscar Reyes. So he makes more than the $12. We gave him some money. It's not a lot, but it's something. So the title of the sermon, Don't Worry, Be Working. No te preocupadas por estar trabajando, right? We've got to work for the Lord. It doesn't matter what we're doing. We look at the outline of Matthew chapter 6, and just look at it with me real fast. Let's look at it. Because this is, I hope you notice the title of the sermon is a Bible study. So if you got your electronic Bible, turn off your game. And uh, how about this? Go to Matthew chapter 6. This morning our Sabbath school was God's love versus our love. God's love versus selfishness, right? So let's roll. Outline, chapter 6. Do good, what do you do? You please God. That's not me saying that. Remember Jesus? He talked about this in Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes. And oh man, Jesus says if somebody wants to take your cloak, if somebody wants to take your shirt, tunic, let them have your cloak also. I got to learn that one. I really have to learn that one myself. Someone slaps you on the cheek, turn the other one to them also. Love your enemies. It says, verse 48, chapter 5. Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father is perfect. And then he goes on to say, if you want to be perfect, what do you need to do? Do good. If you want to be perfect, have the model prayer. The last time I checked, the model prayer says what? Give us this day, verse 11, our daily what? Bread. And forgive people who mess with us. That's a hard one. Fasting only to be seen. Lay up your treasures in heaven. And in verse 22 and 23, the lamp of the body. The lamp is your eye. Therefore, be careful, little eyes, what you see. And then he comes to verse 24, and he says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one, love the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Did you hear that? Can't serve God and money. You can't take it with you. So now we're left with this idea of ways to deal with worry. Well, let's talk about worry. Did you know chronic worrying? What can chronic worrying do to you? Just yell it out. It makes you old fast. Good one. Chronic worrying. Lose sleep. It hurts relationships. Hurts job performance. It can ruin your appetite. Check this out. Many people who are excessively um, anxiety ridden seek relief in overeating, cigarette smoking, and use of alcohol and drugs. Is that true? When, you know, one of, the, one of the biggest things we've got going in this country right now is pharmaceuticals. We're the only country in the world that advertises pharmaceuticals on TV. Did you know that? I think Australia is starting to do it now. But over in Europe, you don't see commercials for drugs. You don't. You don't see it down in South America. You don't see it in Central America. In fact, some of the things that you get that you have to have a prescription for, you can get over the counter down in Central America. And they're not all hooked up on drugs either. And think about it. A new study came out. And, well, we'll get to that in a minute. But that's absolutely amazing. So, does worry kill us? What are some ways worry can kill us? Heart disease? Strokes? 
cancer. We've got a couple doctors in the house. We know that cancer is part of our lives no matter what, right? It's when our immune system goes down, what happens to the cancer? It breaks out of the containment, and it starts to spread throughout the body. That's what kills people. So what about worry? Is it killing American society? What percent of the adult population do you think is worrying and has chronic worrying problems? Anybody guess? 20%. Over to 40 to 50 million people have chronic worrying problems that actually has affected their, um, their lifestyle and they have anxiety disorders, and they are being treated by doctors right now. 20 million people, or 20% of the population, goes to the doctor because they worry too much. You talk to teachers. <laughs> a lot of teachers are on Xanax, Zoloft, and a lot of different things in the public schools because of what we deal with. But there's ways to deal with stress. We're told, number one, my mom always told me, you are what you eat. Have you heard that before, yes or no? If you eat a bunch of junk food, you're not going to feel so good. If you eat healthy food, your immune system's up, you feel better, you're stronger, feel better. Physical activity. Get off the couch. She walked in to the health club, and Jeff comes over and goes, Howard, can you give her a tour of the wellness center and let her know what's here? So I'm walking this lady around who's only 65, and she's, you know, I didn't always used to be this big. I didn't always have these ankle problems. I I, I just gotten fat. COVID happened, and then I I retired from work, and I've just, I'm embarrassed to come in and work out. I said, why? Isn't that what a health club's for, is to work out? I said, you got to start doing something. And I told her something simple, and she goes, oh, I never thought of that. I said, start, if you can't walk very far, because she's got bad ankles, and she said, I can't walk very far. I said, fine, walk to the end of your driveway, and walk back, and do it about two or three times, and then do it about next day four or five times, and then do more, because I said, motion is lotion. Our, our nutrition and our physical activity can help us de-stress. It really can. Deep breathing. Enough said about that. Get a healthy night's sleep. Get a healthy night's sleep. You know what you do with the phone? Turn it on mute. If you use it as an alarm clock like I do two days a week to get up at 3.30, put it on mute. And then it's next to the bed and it only goes off to wake you up. So you get a good night's sleep. Go to bed earlier. There's nothing wrong, Sue. There's nothing wrong with going to bed at 8, 9 o'clock at night, is there? That's late. I knew she was going to say that. That's why I set you up. She goes to bed a little bit earlier, but she's up. She's always happy in the morning. Folks, we got to start changing our lifestyle. Build relationships and a sense of purpose. By the way, this is the National Institute of Health, okay? And notice what they put as number one. Nutrition, let me just back up. This is from National Institutes of Health, nutrition and physical activity. Is there anything missing in this list? This one. Mindfulness, 
meditation, and prayer. I added the and scripture. They didn't put that part in. They just said meditate, have mindfulness, have a sense of purpose. So here we go. Ready? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Turn to there, would you please? Trust in the Lord with what? And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. There it is, folks. All right, I'm done. We can go home. There it is. It's easy. How do we get there? Well, let's start talking about it. Matthew 6, 25, 26. Let's go back to Matthew. Hopefully you kept your spot in there. Therefore I say to you, don't worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, about your body, what you'll put on, is not life more than food. And then he says, in the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet, their heavenly fa- yet your heavenly Father feeds in them feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? The first thing Jesus tells you is what? Don't what? Worry. Ah, God, you don't understand. I want to go back to school. I want to go back. I got to teach those kids. I have to, I have to help the AP kids. I, I'm the only one who can help them pass that test. God, I want to go back to school. I, want, I, I need to teach the kids. And for two years, I sat home. For the first year, first six months, it really tore me up. And it wasn't until one day I looked and said, you know what? I need to get a job someplace. I need to do something. I need to get out of the house. I need to start doing things. And that's when my life changed. We are talking about changing priorities. You know, that's what it's all about. Change your priorities. You change your outlook on life. Back, you know, I guess, how do I want to say this? I'm trying to be charitable, okay, but I'm just going to say this. Back when the government officials had common sense, probably 50 or 60 more years ago, the United States Public Health Service issued a statement in connection with the prevalence of nervous disease and the tendency to worry and how it weakened and shortened life. Over 50 to 60 some years ago, the National Institutes on Health, which which it is called now, said, Life is being shortened because people are worrying. And somebody who must have been a Christian wrote these words. They should sound familiar to you. They wrote this in a government publication. Do you understand what I'm saying? So far as is known, no bird has ever tried to build more nests than its neighbor. No fox has ever fretted because it only had one hole in which to hide. No squirrel ever died of anxiety because he couldn't lay up enough for two winners instead of one. And no dog has lost sleep over the fact that he didn't have enough bones laid aside for his declining years. The government wrote that. That's kind of cool, isn't it? That's right from here. Today, the government says, don't worry, a new study came out, and you know what they're doing to help people, Howard, for people who are worried? They're giving them psychedelic drugs. Psychedelic drugs. 
Folks, that's messed up. They're not telling them, oh, turn it over to the Lord, because they don't have any Lord to turn it over to in the public today. Wow. Let's keep going. Ready? All right. Oh, sorry. Got to read the next verse. 27, 28. You there? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? <laughs> so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, neither do they toil nor spin. Yeah. You know, Howard, I wish I were 6'3 or 6'4. I really wanted to be that when I was in high school. I could have been an awesome wide receiver. I had it all figured out. That, that height. At 6'2, I was doing pretty good. But I wanted to be 6'3, 6'4. And then, I still yet run into things all the time and hit my head. How about you? There's an advantage. But did I grow taller because I wanted to? Can, you, can anything change because of worry? How many of you have changed something because you worried about it? Raise your hand. Nobody's changed something because they worried about it? I don't think so. It's not going to happen. So worrying can give you anxiety. It can give you panic. And many chronic worriers have a sense of impending doom and unrealistic fears that increase their worries. Case in point, I got all strapped in. I was all ready to go on this swing. It probably dropped you, what, 10, 15 feet, Susan? Maybe 20 feet? It didn't seem like it dropped that far. I got, they strap me in on top. They strap you in underneath. You're wearing a harness. You've got another harness here. You've got another harness here. You have a helmet on. You've got another harness here. And I got up to the edge, and I looked down, and I'm not afraid of heights, and all of a sudden, I started to go like this. My face turned white, and I said, I can't do this. Why? Because I looked down, and I saw this thing that was going to drop, and then it dropped, and it just took you on a swing. And it swung you out about this far, about 75 feet out, in the air like a pendulum, and then you came back, and then you went just like this, okay? And you were suspended 25 to 30 feet above the air. I couldn't do it. I froze. Here's this, no feelings intended, but a little shorter El Salvadorian guy telling me, come on, back up, back up. And I'm like, I can't do this. I can't move. No, no. You have to back up. Back up. And I'm like, no. And it was finally when Juana came up to me. Howard, back up. He's not going to let you drop. Back up. And I got back like this, and I stood here like this, and he started to unharness me from everything. I said, no, I'm too close to the edge, and I backed up some more. And then he unharnessed me and said, you stand over here. And then he helped me down the stairs. That's what fear can do to you. It was an irrational fear. I was, I was harnessed in three different ways. Mark, the cable was this, it was like this thick. It supported 350 pound people. I'm only 190. I'm good. What happened? The worry and fear overruled my common sense. Do you understand? Even though I knew I'd be okay on that swing, even though I watched people do it, I got up there and I said, no, I can't do it. 
That's what fear does to you. It paralyzes you. That's what worry does to you. Worry can't add to your life. And if you're worried about what you're going to eat and drink, it's not good. So then we come to verse 28. Do not worry about clothing. We said that. And, and then I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow thrown into an oven, will he not more clothe you, O you, of what? Little faith. And then we come to verse 31. There it is again, these words. They just really bother me. So do not what? Worry. Don't worry. Have joy and peace in Christ. Don't worry. We talked about persecution. Persecution is coming. Okay? Right now, I can be fired from my job if I misgender or mislabel a student. I can be fired. It's that easy. Am I worried about it? No. I'm not. We can't. Because you know what? We can't do anything about it anyway, can we? I'm absolutely amazed how God keeps saying, don't worry. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I forgot to put it in Spanish. I apologize. Don't worry. No preoccupatus. There it is. Don't worry. Don't worry at all. And then he tells me something. Don't worry about what you eat. Don't worry about what you drink. Don't worry about what you wear. He says all the what? Verse 32. For all the Gentiles, and in this version says, for all the pagans run after these things. And your heavenly Father knows you have need of them. You don't need as many clothes as you have in your closet. Did you know that? Did you know why? Because you can only wear one pair at a time. Okay? You don't need to have all the colored shirts. You don't need to have all this. You don't need to have a new car all the time either. You know why? Because the old car will run just fine. You don't need to wor worry about keeping up with the Joneses because the Joneses will always be ahead of you. Because there's always somebody else. I thank God that I have a wife who we agreed that when we bought the house in 1996, we were going to stay there for the rest of our lives. We were not going to move out of the starter home into another home and incur new debt. I am so grateful for her doing that. Because now, as we've gotten older, she's very good at saving money. I think she worries a little bit too much about money, but that's just me. God, God, um, God hasn't given me that concern about money. She's very good with the money. I'm, I'm good at spending it. You can ask her. For all of these things the Gentiles seek, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But notice what it says in verse 33. What does it say in verse 33? <laughs> seek ye first the kingdom of God. Let's think about that for a minute. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is very simply John 14, 27. A peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gave to you. Let not your hearts be what? Worried! Neither let them be fearful. <clears throat> there it is. There it is. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you the peace of all times in every way. The Lord be with you. 
How many of you think the world has really got its um, morals messed around and messed up? Only three people? Y'all think the world is doing just fine with, the, with its morals? All of us have to agree that the world is messed up. It's going to continue to be messed up. But what does Jesus say? I give you peace. Verse 31 flies in our face again. It says, don't worry. Don't worry. Then verse 31, 32. So don't worry. Comes from Jeremiah, by the way. And I apologize. I, this is out of place. Um, that one is out of place. Look at what it says. Oh, sorry. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or drink? For the pagans run, know these things. For I have plans for you. Does God have plans for you? Yes, he does. He has plans for you to prosper and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. The devil can kill you. The devil can kill your physical body. But what he can't kill is your spirit and your salvation. Only you can lose that. Notice what it says. Then you will call on me, come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Isn't that cool? All we got to do is realize God's got a plan for us and he'll take care of us. He will take care of our needs, not our wants. Man, I got a lot of wants. God ain't taking care of them, but he's taking care of our needs. So as we look at 33, and we got two verses left. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be given to you as well. Go back to Jeremiah 29, 13. Jeremiah 29, 13. Can you turn to there real quick? It says, and you will what? You will seek me and what? Find me. There it is. Seek first the kingdom of God. You'll find me. Search with all your heart. There it is. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. That's what you're... Okay. I put the same verse twice. That's what Susan was trying to tell me this morning. I missed that. Matthew 6.34. Well, can I, can I take you to one more verse in Jeremiah? God's calling card. First time I heard this, I freaked out. This is really cool. Jeremiah 33.3. He says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not. No. Do you want to know things? Ask God to give you wisdom of what's happening. The Bible says the last days it's going to be crazy. But it also says the Word of God is going to go forth to all the world. So now we're back at Matthew 6.34. We're at the end of this little Bible study. It says, therefore, don't what? There it is again. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. How many of you have ever had something that you've really dreaded is going to happen to you? You just think it's the worst thing in the world. And then when it happens to you, it really wasn't that bad. Anybody ever experienced that? You sure have. It's called anxiety. And we build up something in our minds so badly that we don't realize that it'll take care of itself. It's not going to be as bad as it was. What's the worst thing that can happen to a teacher? They can hit somebody in the mouth, right? Correct? 
or they can just hit somebody. What happens to you? You're going to go home. You're going to be suspended. So I put my hand out like this the other day. And the young boy was walking, and he walks right in front, right in front of my hand as I go like this. And I smack him right in the mouth. His lip gets a little bit larger. I'm thinking, oh, no. Oh, my goodness, what happened? I'm freaking out. I'm literally hyperventilating, trying to figure out how did this happen. I'm going to be suspended. He goes, I need to go and film me, film me. I'm sore. And I'm like, oh, my God. I call down to the nurse, and I say, nurse, I don't understand what happened. He, he got hit in the mouth. Well, how did you hit him in the mouth? I, I, I don't know. I have no idea how this happened. I put my hand out like this, and he walked right into it. It turns out I put my hand out like this, and as he came around, he was turned around like this, and he hit, hit, hit his mouth right there. Just got him. Just perfect storm. The kids are like, Mr. Kruger, are you okay? And I'm like, no, nah, I, 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 I'm terrified. I don't know what's happening. But you know what? Look at what it says. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. You know what? He went down and he says, I ran into my teacher's hand. And the nurse said, okay. They gave him some salve. He came back to class. The next day, we were joking about it. I went like this when Junior walked by me. I said, I'm going to keep my arms down like this, Junior. When you walk by, he goes, okay. He said, no, I'm not going to walk behind you. It was a joke. I was so worried. I was terrified. Folks, you don't understand how terrified I was. I ran to the union rep right after that happened. Told him what happened. Because you never know, right? So, that was a case where Howard didn't take his own I've been working on this sermon, says don't worry. And what happened to me? I worried. I hyperventilated. The kids are like, Mr. Kruger, are you okay? Are you okay? You don't look so good. I'm like, no, I'm not good. I'm not good at all. What happened? Samuel explained to me what happened. I'm like, oh my goodness, can you write that down? He did. He's laughing as he writes it down. Because it was a mistake. But what about today's society? So I got a jar, right? Have you heard of this experiment, the jar? You take a jar, and you put rocks in it, and you ask the questions to the students. The professor did. He was, he was running a class on business, and he said, is the jar full? And the students said, yeah, it is. It's completely full. You can't put anything else in there. The professor said, well, okay, let me see. The pebbles. So he put in a bunch of pebbles. Notice all those pebbles went in that jar when it looked full. And then he said, is the jar full? And the college students were fortunately smart enough to say, no, it's not full. We, we, we got you now. We know what you're talking about. So then he puts in the sand. And he says, why did I do this? And you're asking, why am I telling you this story, right? The, the rocks, by the way, were uh, two inches in size and the little pebbles were smaller. I was going to actually do this. My wife said to do this for a children's story. It'd be awesome. Yeah, I'm going to do it someday. Because here's the deal. If you take and fill the jar with sand, can you put the big rocks in? So let's talk for a minute. Let's be honest. The rocks represent our priorities. And what are our priorities in life? God, family, job. Correct? The pebbles are the things that might occupy our job, uh, our time, school, job. Might not be that important. Might be just something you do to make money. But here's the deal. Is there more sand there than bigger rocks. The sand represents material possessions. Do you understand? If we're so focused on all of the material possessions, 
we lose sight of what's important. Losing sight of what's important is so very important. You know, losing sight of what's important can kill you? Well, how does that happen? There was a young lady. She was a TikTok influencer, and she became a pilot. And she got on a plane, and she said, Dad, I want to take you on a, on a flight with me, but while, while we're on the flight, I'm going to be recording. Just know that, because i got to do this for my fans, because they got to see things. Father says, okay, sounds good. I trust you, no problem. He gets on the plane with her. Sure enough, there were cameras all around, 360. She was talking. I'm with my dad. I'm on the plane. We're taking off. You can see us now. And she turns the camera, and she shows the ground, and she shows take it off, right? And then she turns back the camera to her dad, and she says, are you enjoying your flight, Father? And he says, yes, I am. And then something tragic happens. She crashes the plane and they both die later. Why? Because she wasn't paying attention to the plane. She didn't know that particular plane instruments as well as she needed to. She was so focused on the cameras capturing every part of the, de of the journey that she died. Folks, we can be so caught up in the materialistic things, in our job, everything else, that we forget to make God first. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. The other stuff will take care of itself. It really will. Dear Heavenly Father, were my words, Lord. They were yours. Lord, you tell us in Jeremiah 29, 11, and 12 that you have plans for us. They're great plans that we don't even understand. And that your ways are higher than ours. And that you will take care of us no matter what. Lord, I pray right now that each and every one of us may gain a blessing from hearing this sermon may gain a blessing and truly put things first that deserve to be first. You, oh God, help us to change our heart, which only you can do. Help us to stay faithful and be working. And don't worry. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Please stand for our closing hymn, hymn number 508, Anywhere with Jesus, hymn number 508. cannot
not know anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I can go to sleep when the gloomy shadows round about me creep, knowing I shall wake and never more to roam. Anywhere with Jesus will be home, sweet home. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. I can safely go. Okay. Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, and I'll read through thirteen. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and I will seek, and you will seek me and find me, and you will search for me with all of your heart. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for providing for us. Thank you for taking care of everything for us. Thank you for providing for us and for giving us peace and for being our God and hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And there is an announcement about a health message today at, at 6. There'll be a Zoom link that Howard can give you, so just see him. <laughs>